Welcome, everybody, to What the Truck on this beautiful Monday afternoon from Freight Alley in downtown Chattanooga, Tennessee. I'm Michael Vincent, the dude, and he is Dooner. What's going on, my friend? Man, I'm a little tired. It was uh, it was a crazy you know Sunday night. I'm watching the Pats play the Seahawks. A really, really good Sunday night football game, despite the right. outcome. And then, uh, then the Freightways virtual war room starts lighting up, and uh, we're starting to get information that Trevor Milton may be out at Nicola, we get it confirmed. We put the story out. It starts going viral. Uh, we start getting new information, new allegations coming through, some correct, some false. So there's a lot to go through on today's show. And I think we're going to dive into it. Yeah. I can't wait to do that. Right. It was a crazy night, a turn of events. Uh, uh, and the story continues right with uh, rumors and all kinds of things going out there. I don't think we'll get into those rumors as, uh, but yeah, we need to dig into this. Cause this is, uh, this is, this is big news, especially in the EV world, right? Absolutely. In the EV world, we actually have one of the the biggest bloggers in that space coming on today's show. He was part of a group of uh, Tesla fans who had one of the last public visits over at Nikola. He was able to spend about seven hours with Trevor Milton just about a month or two ago. So we'll get some insights on him and, and the rabbit hole starts going deeper when we talk to that gentleman. We're also going to talk to Alan Adler. He's our Detroit bureau chief to get the uh, the ones and zeros about what went down, especially with that 8K filing and what that means for for uh, Nicola and for Trevor Milton moving forward. But first, let's tip the band over here. September is Pro Driver Appreciation Month, and Pilot Flying J is celebrating with a free drink every day in the app. It's a different deal every single day, Michael Vincent, so you won't get bored. So log in there, see what's new. See pilotflyingj.com for uh, details and for terms and conditions. Head there right Wait. after the show. <laughs> Headline: We're going to get out to Alan Adler about it, but it's Steve Gursky. He's replacing Trevor Milton at the embattered Nikola company. Let's get uh, Alan Adler on the phone and see what went down uh, between last night and now with Nikola. It's been a while. Alan. Alan, you are on the air with Dooner and the Dude on What the Truck. Thank you so much for uh, for reaching out to us. You know, you've been on the show quite a bit because there's been a ton of Nikola news, but some of the biggest broke late last night with Trevor Milton. Leaving the company, he says it's of his own volition. Uh, you know, the 8K seems a little bit otherwise, but let's let's dive into it. What happened? Set the table for us. All right. Well, I, I learned it about when you did, and, and of course, it was a Freightways report that uh, broke the news. And, uh, you know, it, it doesn't come as a big surprise now that it's happened, if that makes any sense. Um, this guy was a distraction. Love Trevor. Great guy. Great copy. But he was a distraction to the company. And the lack of his uh, tweeting in the last week probably helped them a little bit. Now that he's out of the picture, and he'll still be a very, very wealthy man because he owns, you know, more than twenty percent of the stock. Uh, you know, they can go on and, and presumably let uh, let adults run the place. Not to say that Trevor wasn't an adult, but simply to say that his approach, which was sort of like a mini me to Elon Musk, uh, was not winning them a lot of fans. Wow. Okay. <laughs> so, get it. Get him off the Twitter machine, huh? <laughs> well, I I think he. He may, he may return, but uh, you know what, what we know is that is that uh, you know he basically uh, you know couldn't stay. It wasn't going to work out. Um, you know I know Steve Gursky pretty well, who's the new chairman. I've worked with Steve in the past uh, in a past life uh, at GM, and and uh, and he's a serious guy. And I think Mark Russell is, is a serious guy. We probably won't hear quite as much from Nicola. I mean, their problem, guys, quite honestly, is they had nothing to really talk about, mm -hmm. and yet they kept talking. Their travel kept talking. And uh, I happen to believe in their business plan, and I'm reading analyst reports today. You know, they're knocking down their target price a little bit, but they're sticking with them. They're saying, you know what? Probably a good thing that Trevor's not there. You know, there was a rumor. It's, it, it turned out to be false, but I mean, I mean, some bigger sites like TechCrunch even put it out there that Nicola was arrested. But just, and I don't want to give any validity to the rumor because we know that it's not true. But is there any danger? Of that, are there criminal allegations here? We've heard about the DOG yeah. and those kind of things looking into it. Is this is this realistic? 
Well, you, you and I have talked about this, Junior, and, and and I don't I don't believe that we should rush to any kind of judgment. I'm really glad that our site, FreightWaves, did not carry this uh, arrest report. Uh, Nicola knocked it down for me, and I shared it with uh, with obviously our team, and 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 we stayed clear of it. I'm not even real comfortable talking about something that didn't happen. Uh, but I'll tell you that uh, you know we got to let this thing play play out. Uh, I'm I am not a lawyer. I don't know if there's anything there if. If, you know, what they did as a private company is anything that would uh, draw the interest of the SEC or not, you know, the SEC and the uh, U.S. attorney in the Southern District of New York, who, who is very active in a lot of things, uh, quite honestly, neither of them have confirmed they're looking at anything. Now, that doesn't mean they're not, doesn't mean they are. But, uh, you know, I so I guess I've had this whole thing all along about rushing to judgment. And so, you know, I didn't fall out, fall over last night when I saw that, that Trevor was out. But, but, you know, the fact is that uh, I think that if you talk to Hindenburg, and I haven't, they would probably say they, they did a lot more damage than they set out to do. Yeah, that's a Alan, solid point, Alan. Alan, this 8K filing, it, it, what does this mean for Trevor Milton? Is there, first of all, can you explain what an 8K filing is, and and is there interest in in there? Is there any interesting uh, clauses that are inside this 8K? You know what? I haven't, uh, Michael. I haven't read the 8K yet. An 8K okay. basically is a required filing that a company, public company, files with the Securities Exchange Commission when there is a material activity in the company, like the resignation of their executive chairman. That would clearly qualify for for an 8K. I need to do some reading this afternoon. I've obviously been been uh, doing a lot of writing this morning, and uh, so I need to get into that a little bit, take a look. But uh, I don't know what's in it. I'll tell you. Uh, my, I'll tell you. I'll tell you. I'll tell you what's you in it. Tell me. Tell me, Junior. Yes. Tell me, brother. Well, there's even a social media clause that says prior to using any social media to make any statements regarding the company, the executive agrees to consult with the executive's counsel and the company's chief legal officer. There's a lot of protections in there about what the board can and cannot say about Trevor Milton, what Trevor Milton can and cannot say. He has waived uh, some of his founders agreements as part of this. Uh, it looks like he did. I mean, for all he's saying that he approached the board to distance himself, to remove himself. The AK does not read that way at all. Yeah, well, I mean, let's let's not kid kidders here, right? Typically, you know, you're allowed to say face in a case like this, but but we all know uh, he probably uh, got pushed. He probably didn't jump. Yeah, the eight K reads uh, like they had it sitting in their back pocket. Um, so that that's what it sounds like. They were prepared for for this type of thing. Well, Steve Gursky, Alan, you know Steve Gursky. Uh, can you give us a little bit on Steve Gursky, who's who's taking the helm there? Steve Gersky is. Yeah, I mean, I happen to—I have a lot of respect for the guy. I think he's a really sharp guy. He has been all over the place and worked uh, pretty much all over the auto industry for for decades. Um, he was an analyst on Wall Street. He uh, uh, advised General Motors uh, for a while, then of course became part of General Motors. Worked with the United Auto Workers, um, you know, and 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 helped them out. Uh, ran uh, GM's business in uh, when they owned Opel in Europe. So he's got uh, a ton of. Experience experience. Um, his, his new company, Vecto IQ, which brought Nikola public, it's a, that's very important to note here. Um, you know, they, they see, and they have a lot of people from around the auto industry, including former GM people that, uh, you know, have been involved and were early buyers in the, in the pipe and the, when, when people could buy, a uh, Vecto IQ stock at a discount before the, the reverse merger. Uh, you know, there are a lot of former GM people in there. So he's got a network that is enormous and he's got the respect of most people. He certainly has mine. Um, a very serious guy. Um, and somebody that I think, you know, probably will do a, a terrific job of bringing them back in, into line. I mean, they're, they're going to have to listen. It's really important here, guys, uh, having done this on the other side of the corporate side. When you bring in a crisis communications firm, it's only good if you listen to them. Yeah. They've got a good one in there, and they're listening to them. Alan, I, I got to ask you a question. We we have to get off the line in just a minute here, but are SPACs in trouble? You know, SPACs, uh, Nicola is one of the ones. You mentioned Vect IQ, uh, a big, big SPAC that moved in. People who hit at 90 did very well with it. But does it call into question SPACs uh, moving forward? I, I don't think so, but I have no particular knowledge. Mm, okay. All right. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think so. Okay. I, I, I'm kind of looking at, at GM as the plot hole that kind of su sunk Nic Nicola because it called all their technology into question. And it does seem like Trevor kind of dunked on himself a number of times when he was trying to prove that this was a real vehicle. And You're going to see that this is a real truck. This is not a pusher.
you know, <laughs> saying that. And then uh, the most recent was when he showed the tray and the Financial Times pointed out that those batteries were also third party batteries. So uh, Nicholas going to have a lot to overcome, but maybe getting rid of Trevor at this point in time is the right step in doing it. Uh, I know you're going to keep abreast of the story, get inside AK and all of that kind of stuff. Probably have something else on FreightWaves.com soon. But Alan Adler, thank you so much for your time today. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks, Alan. Yeah, I mean, a wild story. And, you know, one of the reasons people hammer so hard, uh, hammer the company so hard is because of uh, of this. That's incredible because we're really the only company that has been vertically integrated from the beginning to the end. We own our own hydrogen facility that we're building. We own our own plant, our own conversion, our own distribution, and now our own manufacturing of the truck. Yeah. Oh, well, and they don't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I know it's big claims. Uh, you know, hopefully they have someone more tempered in place now. As uh, But now we're going to dial out to Tom Wiley. He is with Level 1 Technologies in St. Louis, Missouri. He wrote an article on FreightWaves.com that was called, Are Small Truck Load Carriers Worth Saving? Wow, that's a, that's a, that's a, uh, that's a eye-catching headline right there. Tom, thanks for joining us on the air. Yeah, thank you very much. So uh, yeah, introduce yourself, sir. So I mentioned the article, but, uh, but, but who's the man behind the article? All right. Um, the man behind the article is really me, um, based my um, article and its premise on really 30 years of experience in the transportation industry um, that included uh, a long stint as an investor and director of a small truckload carrier, also uh, a, a lengthy uh, period spent as a freight forwarder and broker, but more recently as a software developer that early on in the uh, in my career recognized that really there was a lack of software to help small trucking companies, you know, become more profitable uh, by controlling their costs. And so um, that really is the background that brought me to the conclusion that I reached today in lieu of some current things that have been happening in the market. And really kind of the whole basis of my conclusion is really the totality of my experience in the market as a small carrier attempting to become profitable and staying in business. Mm. Yeah, very good, Tom. Hey, Tom, Mike Vincent here. Uh, nice to meet you uh, on, on this show here, and thanks for being on. In the article, though, you talked about recent events that put a great deal of financial pressure on small truckload carriers and caused many of them to either go out of business or downsize their fleets. Can you tell, talk to us a little bit about those events that caused those things to happen? Sure. Um, really, there's a series of events that um, uh, came long after the major event that brought me into the industry, which was deregulation, which had the impact of bringing lots and lots of carriers into the industry and driving rates down. But over time, those uh, those excess carriers began to uh, begin to leave the industry because of those rates and because of high expenses. But about every 10 years um, during my career in the trucking industry, we would experience something major that would happen that would drive the economy down and it would severely affect our operations. Uh, we can all remember the World Trade Center uh, issue that happened that uh, severely impacted the economy uh, and, and really made uh, you know, being in the trucking business a very difficult time. Second one was the uh, event we now call the Great Depression, but that was the subprime mortgage crisis, which you know knocked the underpinnings out of many small carriers, drove them out of business, caused others to reduce their fleet sizes. More recently, we have the pandemic. About every 10 years, we have something major that happens that causes small carriers who are used to earning what I call substandard revenue, experiencing high expenses, it forces them either out of business or it puts them in a position where they have to downsize their fleets. And I think the accumulation of all of that over time has changed the market from what was a very strong shipper's market with an excess of trucks to suddenly we find ourselves in a, in a carrier's market in an economy, frankly, that is not in full swing yet. So it doesn't really portend very well for the future in terms of what this capacity issue is going to be once the economy you know, comes back into full swing. Well, interesting. Given these losses, though, and the potential for future losses, what steps do you think that brokers and shippers should take to reverse some of these trends? Well, you know, I think that brokers, uh, and I'll, I'll really point to shippers because the brokers are representing shippers. I think shippers for a long time have gotten their way with 
with what I call substandard pricing, and and they've really made brokers uh, bid at that level for many, many years. Um, it worked when there was an excess of trucks in the marketplace. It doesn't work now. And I think that the byproduct of those substandard rates is where we are today. We have far fewer carriers than we need to manage the economy. So at least for the foreseeable future, uh, I'm seeing a carrier market, um, which means there's going to be higher rates. And that market is going to last until I think the carriers are willing to expand, uh, but that won't occur until they've kind of rebuilt profitability and has reestablished some financial reserves. So my suggestion uh, in the article, and again, just a suggestion, is for uh, shippers and brokers to sort of eliminate the one price fits all pricing strategy that they've used for years and move back to sort of a true brokerage relationship where the broker is compensated separately from the carrier and the shipper authorizes the broker to negotiate within a range of rates that allows the broker to meet the current competitive rate that the carrier needs to have to work for the broker, actually the shipper through the broker, um, and essentially stay in business to live and fight for another day. That's essentially the, uh, the, uh, the major recommendation that I have in terms of what, you know, of what can be done. Excellent stuff, Tom. So I guess it was in the, in the 1990s that you really discovered that there was a lack of software available to the transportation industry that would help carriers really reduce their costs and achieve profitability. Uh, you talked about that, and you talked about forming level one technologies and specifically developing applications like ePay Manager, um, which you described as a fully automated and interactive. Can you talk to that ePay a little bit for us? Yeah, um, I'll talk to you in terms of what, what brought that concept about. In the trucking industry back then, we were looking for ways to become more efficient. We realized that hiring people and doing things the old-fashioned way uh, by doing routine tasks with staff was simply something that would just consume the revenue dollar that you had. So we were interested in finding ways to integrate as many activities as we could and the front office was easier to integrate uh, in, into that automated process than the back office was because at the time there was simply no replacement for what was then the current status quo. That was exchanging invoices in paper format and uh, receiving checks in return. So as time went on and we, and we started to solidify the, the, our, our, our front office or our operational side, we began to really focus on what can be done to automate the back office, and that gave birth to ePay Manager. Uh, simply a concept based upon self-invoicing, and the entire purpose of it was to automate the billing and approval and payment process so that you know we could lower costs and at the very same time give carriers the very benefit that they wanted to help them stay in business, which was improving their cash flow. And to accomplish that, we went with an integrated design that allowed them to essentially choose the date that they wanted to be paid based upon a pre-approved payment uh, uh, option that included a discount offered by the broker. And it ultimately became a win-win for both sides. A very fast, efficient processing backed by choices and complete visibility. It was the solution that, that we needed at the time as a carrier and we thought that since it was being built out, we would eventually build it out and offer it to the industry as a whole. Wow. Thanks, Tom. Hey, hey great information. We are out of time. But if people want to learn more about Level 1 Technologies, where should they go? Well, I can go to, uh, to uh, www.level1technologies.com or preferably to epaymanager.com, epaymanager.com. Simple enough. Appreciate the time. Sounds good. Thank you for your time today, Tom. Well, we have a, a, a level one technologies, the president over there. Exciting conversation, right, Michael Vincent? Yeah, excellent stuff. Excellent stuff. Love talking to Tom. Yeah, well, first of all, it's incredible. Um, the main reason why is that when the whole WeWork debacle happened, you know, they found out that the house was a house of glass, right? So when a crack started happening, the whole thing came down. And in the private market, a lot of people would instantly, after WeWork, they instantly just said, you know, what, why are you not the next we work? You know, they were very skeptical about anybody. It didn't matter who they were. Yeah. And that was Trevor Milton on our own show yeah. talking about in public, why he felt it was great. 
He mentioned WeWork, a little bit ironic, said, uh, you know, that that first shatter, you know, the house of cards came down, the uh, house of glass shattered, and, you know, similar things happening with Nicola, unfortunately. Let's call Omar at uh, Omar's blog. He's a big popular Twitter Tesla follower. He was along with the uh, those Trevor and the uh, trolls thing that they did over at Nicola headquarters. We're done up to right now. Hey, Omar, what's up, man? Hey, Tim, great to talk to you. So you have been you have been chasing this rabbit hole of Nikola for quite some time. You have a very very popular pro Tesla Twitter site right at uh, Whole Mars blog. You do you do a right. great job on there. Some people you know named Trevor Milton might call you a troll, but uh, I think that <laughs> I got coverage. You know you have fun with it, but you've also been very fair when you have found things out about Nikola in terms of saying you know these are rumors. This is information people have sent to me. Um, but you got to go there firsthand, right? Tell me how that opportunity right. came about. Yeah, well, so I started following uh, Nikola, you know, pretty much around the time that I heard uh, that they were suing Tesla. That was kind of the first I heard of them. Um, and then it was really uh, this summer when they did the uh, reverse IPO process that people really started paying attention to this company and uh, people really started talking about this company. And the more I looked into it, the more I thought, you know, this is one of the most hilarious and strange companies I've ever seen in the business world. (laughs) Trevor Milton and the rest of this company, it's just like nothing you've ever seen from another company. So a lot of people were kind of making fun of the guy for some of his kind of crazy statements saying he changed the world and all that. And he said, you know what? I'm going to invite the skeptics here to Nikola headquarters to prove them once and for all that, you know, our trucks are real because people were saying, you know, we don't even know if your trucks are real. And I was like, I got to get in this visit. <laughs> so <laughs> I kind of snuck my way in there. They tried to take a nice group of people, but, uh, you know, I happened to, you know, uh, Kristen, she got invited and, uh, I was on a podcast with her. So I kind of snuck my way in there and, uh, got the tour of, uh, Nikola and, um, yeah, it kind of culminated now in uh, Trevor Milton's resignation last night. Did you think it was a setup? Because of of all people, you know, I I, I follow you on Twitter. I probably w- I probably wouldn't invite you to to my company for that level of scrutiny <laughs> that you would bring. But Trevor had this problem where he really liked the attention from trolls. He really really encouraged them. He really fed uh, fed them. He brought them into his home, and uh, you know, it may have blown blown up in his face a little bit here. But did you think this was a setup at all? How did that experience go? I think you were there for like seven hours, right? Right. So I think clearly now in retrospect, it was a huge mistake. Um, At the time, you know, Trevor probably thought, hey, I'm proving all these people who said my company's fake, my truck isn't real wrong. This is this great, you know, publicity stunt to prove, you know, everyone wrong. But when we got there, you know, he told us that, hey, come to our headquarters and have lunch with us. That was kind of the premise that we were told to come there. And then the night before, they go, hey, well, we've got all these, we've got, you know, hey, we have some, we're going to film part of it. That's what they told us in an email, like, the night before. I said, oh, that's a little strange. And we get there, and there's just, like, these professional camera crews. Like, it was like a Hollywood production. You've got people with cameras, people with boom mics, just videotaping every part of this event for you know nikola pr purposes essentially and uh i'm trying to use the guests as a prop to give the company credibility wow so omar when you got this golden ticket and you got there and they set this stuff up what did you see there and when you were done were you still a skeptic right well you know they did show us a truck that was running and this was supposed to be, well, okay, we've got this truck, but there was no trailer attached and it wasn't running on hydrogen. It seemed to me from what I was seeing there that it was actually running on batteries. 
And Nikola's big thing was that they have this hydrogen fuel cell. So that was a little strange. I was like, okay, they didn't really show us the truck running on hydrogen. They didn't really show us the hydrogen fill up. You know, is this technology really real? And just a week or two later, we found out that they did a deal with GM mm. to use GM's hydrogen fuel cell technology in their truck. Isn't that the so, plot hole? Isn't that a big plot hole? <laughs> like, isn't that the plot hole in the business plan that really helped unravel a lot of this? Like, I went back and watched Nikola World 2016, and I'm sure you did as well. And you're looking at what they said the specs would be and what it could do back then. And it's starkly different than what we're looking at now. Right. Well, when we went there, you know, we were skeptical. We had an eyebrow raised at what we were seeing. And, you know, it seemed like most of the trucks were on stilts. There was a lot of questionable stuff we saw. But, you know, we actually came out kind of more positive. The thing about Trevor is he's such a, just his personality, you know, he makes you like him. Even against all odds, you have to stop and think, hmm, this really doesn't make sense. Because he really tries to convince you and he looks at you in the eye and he says your name and he is great at just building that empathy and building that trust. It was only until later that all these relevations came out that made us realize, wow, this guy really tried to manipulate us. I mean, we found out that one of their videos of a truck driving, they actually towed the truck out to a hill. <laughs> uh, and uh, just a, you know, a very sh- shallow grade tilted the camera to make it look like the ground was fat, <laughs> and then pushed the truck down this hill and videotaped it. And they pretended the truck was running on hydrogen, but it was really just r- rolling down a hill. So once these allegations came out, and employees said, "Hey, you know, we rolled it down a hill. Here was the location of the hill." It came out. The company goes, "These are lies. We're going to respond to them." And then when they finally respond, you know what they said? Well, we never said the truck was running on hydrogen. <laughs> if you look at the title of the video, it says in motion. In motion. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, in motion. All right. Well, now Omar, he's getting crushed under the the gravity of these allegations. But um, you hey, there's there's kind of a, there's kind of a weird story. There's a weird story. There's a lot of other stories that are starting to percolate on Twitter right now. I don't want to talk about all of them because they're not verified. But you had a very interesting conversation with Trevor Milton about a gentleman named Johnny Rob. Do you mind if I just play ten seconds of that clip that you recorded just to uh, put some context to it? Right here. Let me this just is- here. I'll play that. I'll play ten seconds of that really quick, just so people get an idea of what we're talking about. Then you can just let me know the story behind this. But you got an interesting response from him. Here it is. Yeah. I read there was even something where like somebody was got arrested. They were trying to like you know do some extortion or something like that. Yeah, there's actually a good friend of mine a long time ago. He actually went to my wedding. A really wow. good friend of mine for almost. Uh, I think it was about uh, probably more than fifteen years. You know, ten to ten to fifteen years. Great friend of mine went to my wedding. That's crazy. Uh, and and Instagram deleted his a profile because he used it for extortion. And that was the only thing he had in his life was his followers. And he hung himself that night. Wow. What is going on there? Yeah, so this is really something else. And this was one of the reasons I wanted to go to Nikola actually to ask him this. Because I have heard this story several weeks before. And it was just truly one of the most strange and insane stories I've heard in my life. So this guy, Jonathan Howard Robb, Johnny Robb, he was Trevor's best friend, right? You know, he had a group of friends he used to, you know, hang out with and party with. And this guy, Johnny Robb, actually came to his wedding, right? Just to give you a sense of, you know, how close they were and how close all these friends were. And after the IPO or the reverse IPO of Nikola was announced. This guy started posting some stuff on Instagram, basically alleging that, you know, kind of me too allegations against Trevor, that there'd be numerous women that he had been harassing through, you know, Facebook messages saying that, um, you know, just really strange stuff like, hey, you know, will you hook up with some random guy in Vegas? I'll pay you, you know, $2,000. Wow. Just really strange stuff. And the way Trevor's told the story, 
he completely fabricated the conversations. They were fake. And the guy just did it because he was completely on drugs. He was completely delusional. And he told the guy, listen, I'll pay you half a million dollars for you to stop posting this stuff. Come meet me here. I'll give you 50000 of the $500,000. Jonathan Howard Robb comes, and it's a sting operation. And he gets arrested on the spot um, for extortion. Uh, and, wow. you know, they took him to jail and charged him. He was potentially going to be in jail for, you know, 30 years. And when he got out because of COVID, he hung himself. So just a really, really tragic story. Yeah. And, and I was just going to say that it, it is. And now there's other things surrounding it. And we can't verify all the other things. But what we do know is true, right, is that this did happen. The situation with Johnny Robb, it's widely reported. Trevor Milton admits that this happened. What exactly was in there? Um, again, that kind of stuff is percolating on Twitter. We're not sure if those allegations are true, but this is, it's just another bizarre story that seems to follow Trevor Milton, right? I mean, there's a trail of breadcrumbs here and a rabbit hole. Yeah. You know, I think a lot of people are talking about the Indenburg allegations and the truck rolling down the hill, but it seems like the fallout from this Johnny Robb thing. And this is just my speculation. It's actually what caused him to resign. Because when I posted this recording of him telling the story that and this guy was a total drug addict and he was trying to extort me. What happened is some of Johnny Rob's friends heard that recording online and they said, you know what? This is a total lie. This is not how the story happened. He was not trying to make up fake texts to, uh, to, you know, harm Trevor and try and extort him for money. This was actually something that was really happening. There were actually a number of women who Johnny Robb was standing up for that Trevor had uh, had some misconduct towards, including Johnny Robb's girlfriend. And now you've seen a number of allegations, like you said, you know, untrue from everyone from Trevor Milton's cousin to other women he knew and screenshot evidence of some of these, you know, really disturbing conversations with Milton. It's, seems like kind of a me too situation. So that was, you know, we had always wondered like, what was it that he posted? Yeah. That Trevor would get one of his best friends arrested. And now we are starting to hear. Wow. I mean, a tragic story. I mean, there's a lot going on here. If people want to, to get your, your coverage on it, uh, they would go to at whole Mars blog, correct? That's the, the best site to get your info on, on Nikola and especially Tesla. I know you're excited for battery day. You're getting prepared for that. Right. And, uh, I want to thank you for your time today. Thanks Omar for coming on the show. We appreciate some insight into that visit and uh, just giving us some context into what may be going on with that Johnny Rob thing. Yeah. Thanks, Tim. That was really great. Uh, I know you were actually the first people to break the story of Trevor Milton resigning. So props for that and great work. Thanks, man. Uh, take it easy out there and uh, keep uh, promoting EVs. We love it, man. Take it. Be, be cool. Take care. Wow. Good, good. I mean, good stuff out of him. Some of that stuff, a little, I mean, a little, a little salacious, a little tabloid. We, you know, I'm not going to co-sign on it until yeah. we would have sort of verification. But like we said, that Johnny Rob thing is true. And Trevor did admit to it. So I do think it's at least worth mentioning, right? It's, a, it's, it's exploratory. Yeah, it absolutely is. I mean, it, it did occur. Uh, what all the details are of, and the motivation behind it, that's, that starts to become speculation. So uh, but really good insights from 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 Omar. That was really good. Here's a we'll play another clip of Trevor really quick. This is from our interview with him during what the truck back in June. Then we're going to dial it to Wayne Craig to talk about trucking TikTokers. Yeah, it did. It started in our basement, and we were there for almost a year. Uh, it was if you if you actually go back and talk to some of the original employees, and almost every one of them still worked for me. It is such a funny story. We we literally had the cops called on us because we had you know there's a whole. Yeah full of guys down there and they, like the neighbors had no idea what was going on and we have computers everywhere and the cops would show up and, and we'd give them tours of the house and let them see what we're working on because they didn't know if we were running some kind of uh some kind of like you know some some kind of uh, you know bad bad operation out of the basement it was pretty funny we uh some nef nefarious so, activities going on in yeah, 
actually one of one of the neighbors told them that we were running a prostitution ring and so i was laughing i was like <laughs> you know because there's a bunch of guys and a couple at that time a couple of women that worked for us and so wow yeah more, more out of him let's tell us now let's move on to uh to tiktok you know and originally yeah. when we were going to be talking we we're talking away and we thought we would be talking to him about what life is going to be like after TikTok. But it seems like in the 11th hour over the weekend, a deal was struck with, uh, who is it, Oracle? And now Wayne Craig can just dance the night away on TikTok like he likes to. Wayne, what's up, man? Yeah, hey, thanks for having me on. I got to follow all that stuff. Huh? I've got a tall task ahead of me. That was some pretty heavy stuff going on earlier. Yeah, I'm sorry I called. We sorry we were five minutes late, but I, I couldn't I couldn't leave that story, Wayne. I know TikTok's great, but I I, I had to find out with the ending, the conclusion of uh, what Omar had to say. I thought you were going to push me right out the door on this one. That was it was interesting stuff. But no, I, uh, uh, yeah, TikTok was supposedly safe until after the election. A lot of stuff going on with it. Uh, for me personally, uh, I just kept TikToking like nothing was going to happen. Kind of I've kind of gotten a feel for. Mr. Trump's politics. And I don't know. I was just kind of like, would it happen? Would they ban it? Would they not so close to the election? But uh, yeah, it was, it was a pretty interesting weekend. <laughs> so you, uh, let's talk about this. You have been a lot of truckers now starting to get a lot more engaged on social media. Um, you see a lot on YouTube that have been very big. That's probably one of the more traditional places. Facebook groups have been very big for truckers. But TikTok, you know, truckers pretty macho dancing around to a bunch of like preteen hip hop does not necessarily sound like the things that a lot of truckers would do. But you know what? You said, look, it's a way to reach people. It's a way to market. It's a way to have fun. It's a way to network. You've really dove into it. So tell me a little bit about your experience of growing a TikTok account for a trucker. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I anyone who's followed my pages, I do so much on just trucking. TikTok kind of let me uh, be a little bit more free, a little bit more relaxing during a, a 2020 year that we've had. It's been a lot of fun. I don't there's there's a lot more than dancing on there. That's kind of like what everyone, especially our age, thinks it is. But uh, my page in particular, it's really the last probably two months has just exploded. I'm almost at, I'm really close to 100,000 uh, likes. I've went over uh, 10,000 uh, people that have actually followed me. And uh, I, I just do, a, I do dance and they, oh, they just love the dancing and the truck thing, but they can't believe that it's a big enough truck for them to actually do dance around in it. But, uh, yeah, TikTok, yeah, it's, I've seen other people on TikTok do the stuff they do on YouTube. I definitely wanted to do it different, though. But you know what? It's just another way to let the public out there see good in trucking and not the bad. That's awesome, Wayne. Hey, Mike Vincent here. Thanks for being on, Wayne. Uh, aside from TikTok, or including TikTok, but all social social media, you're on LinkedIn quite a bit. I follow you there and, and read your posts, and I, and I love them uh, quite a bit. They're very, very good. So can you talk to that a little bit as truckers, more truckers are using social media, et cetera? What are the benefits there? Uh, and the, what's the return from, from doing this type of stuff as a trucker? Well, I've been doing it for eight years now, and one of the things, if you're if you're a trucker out there listening and want to get on social media, the easiest way to get a crowd is to go negative, talk about the bad things in trucking. Uh, it, it catches on quite quickly. Uh, that's just the kind of world we live in right now. But I've, I've kind of made a living in eight years of uh, staying positive. I call them truth bombs and trying very hard not to uh, um, get myself in the weeds too much with negativity, but I also know we have issues. So if I, if I was a trucker out there going, you know, I'm going to get on TikTok or, or LinkedIn in particular, just keep it professional. I hear that a lot. Like Wayne, you're, you're very professional and we like that, even though sometimes I do get in. It's really, it's really tough sometimes because if I'm going to dive into something that may be controversial, um, it's just kind of hard sometimes to walk that line, but I seem to be able to do a pretty good job at it. I've had in eight years, I've probably deleted maybe 20 posts just because they were a little bit over the top. And I have people reaching out to me to say, to say Wayne, that was kind of explosive. <laughs> uh, we're looking at you dancing right now. Talk about explosive. You're in the hotel room. <laughs> I've, been time. I've been in plenty of hotel rooms like that. I imagine that smelled like six cartons of uh, Marlboro menthol and, uh, <laughs> and some Clorox or something, some, uh, some off-brand Clorox. But, you, you know, I think the cool thing about social media, and you you said it, you're like, TikTok's not just about dancing. It's another communication platform. And as it becomes more mainstream, you know, people are going to find more business use cases for it. One of them is getting news out there. One of them is doing really quick sort of self-help guides, guides into trucking lifestyle type of posts. It's not just uh, 
you know, it's not just middle-aged dudes trying to dance like the kids. We There's other value that you can bring to the platform. Have you met any like new connections or have you gotten any new business out of this? Oh, absolutely. Especially on TikTok. It's the fastest growing app that there is. And I read somewhere, I don't know, I'd have to look deeper into it. I think it's the fastest growing app ever right now. If I ran a trucking company or was in marketing, um, I would, I would start reaching out on TikTok. They say to do, you know, a, a TikTok commercial because it it's where it's at as far as being able to reach people. We all know about Angry Book and uh, LinkedIn. It's great, but are you really? Let's say you're just trying to get truckers into business. LinkedIn's going to limit you, even though I think it's some of the most fun that you can have on LinkedIn. It's very professional. I really like it a lot. But are are you going to have that mass bunch of truckers? In my opinion, YouTube is just angry Twitter with video. Um, I've given up on YouTube, even though I've given up a lot of crowd. <laughs> I've given up a lot of audience because I don't enjoy YouTube. So TikTok for me just kind of fell into that. Okay, I can smile, be happy, have a lot of fun. And uh, yeah, it's just, I, I keep saying it. I've been saying it for three or four months now um, that, you know, now they are reaching out. TikTok is reaching out to small business. Uh, and it's like they're, they're trying to get businesses on board to try to do a TikTok commercial. I think it's the only way to go right now, personally. Wow, that's really that's really interesting, Wayne. I, I didn't know that uh, TikTok was was grabbing that. I've I've not been on TikTok myself. I'm going to have to check it out. But so, Wayne, what's got you heated up? What's firing you up this week? Uh, what's firing me up right now, actually, is I'm not in my truck. My truck has been in the in the shop, and uh, earlier today there was a hit and run in our hotel parking lot. She almost ran me over. I posted it on LinkedIn. Wow! And then she took off. She looked like she was 12 years old. Oh, maybe it was that driver in Ireland, Michael, we talked about. Who was that guy who was having his kid drive the truck down the uh, Irish highways over there? Oh, yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> it was, it was kind of unbelievable. But, but really what I've been – what really has been the last month, month and a half is, is uh, I really do believe us truckers could have a uh, – could talk about the tension. Uh, I think we could change it. Uh, I just did a podcast – I just think it's we, we latch on to these things and we haven't won anything. And I, I do think that the tension is something that a lot of us truckers could actually make a, a change, especially with the FMCSA asking, what is it, 20 or 25 or 30 truck drivers? If they, if they really want to win something, they need to talk about the tension because the tension is actually negatively affecting our economy. And we're so tight. We're paying almost $3 a mile. Um, and then we don't have enough trucks right now. It seems like, well, yeah, a lot of those trucks are sitting in line waiting somewhere for a shipper and receiver. They can't seem to do their job very well. Hey, you on board for, uh, before I let you go, there was a caller who called in on freight waves radio. You started texting me during the program. <laughs> he said that he wanted there to be eight hour days. He wants the ELD to be eight hour days. He doesn't want more hours. He wants normal hours. Are you on board? Yeah, that, my head was going to explode on that one. <laughs> so if anyone's going to get into the uh, trucking industry, uh, just kind of know that we're never going to go back or, or, you know, we have 11 hours we can drive 14 hours. Now they are going to change that a little bit, but it, it just, we never, we'd never move America. If you had truckers work eight hours a day. Um, now I know, I do know for a fact that the teamsters and there's some other people out there that would love to see truckers do an eight hour day, but it's just not going to happen. It's not reality. I don't know why people keep bringing it up on like your shows because it just doesn't make any sense. Once you have more years in the industry, you could probably find a job particular to, let's say, eight, nine, ten hours a day. But the less you run, if you're going to run eight hours, you're not going to make the money that you want to make. And then you're probably going to go on social media and complain there is enough money. Well, you got your eight hours a day. So I, I just... <laughs> Yeah, my, my head was going to explode. This you knew that because I was I was texting you and going, "Oh, why are people still talking about this?" <laughs> yeah, well, hey, Wayne, people who want to learn, they want to see what you're doing on TikTok. They want to figure out how to use it themselves. They want to follow you on LinkedIn. Where do they go? Yeah, on LinkedIn, it's uh, it's easy as a uh, Wayne Craig on LinkedIn. On TikTok, it's, it's just under Wayne Craig as well. Um, I've been popping up. Uh, basically, um, I don't think there's any more uh, C R A G G. By the way, it's Wayne Craig C R A G G. I uh, hope to see you there, and it's my birthday today, so we're celebrating it on TikTok. Wow. Okay. Hey, th thanks a lot, man, and, and happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Thank you man. very much. Thanks. Thanks happy for birthday, me on the 
stay safe out there, Wayne. Exciting stuff. Hey, Taylor Barker says, is that a, Den- a Tennessee shirt you're wearing? Yes, it is, Taylor. It's from, uh, it's actually from this company, Eli Monster. They're in Nashville, Tennessee, actually. So Tennessee, vintage Tennessee shirt, made in Tennessee, sewed in Tennessee. Got those three stars right there. A couple people in the comments saying, uh, Yo, you know, Michael Vincent, they finally put Cobra Kai on Netflix. They, they, they stopped that YouTube premium experiment. Now it's on Netflix and like a whole bunch of people are starting to finally get into it, which is great. Cause it's one of my favorite shows. I'm going to have to check that out. Cobra Kai. So this is uh Danny and everybody uh, years later, I guess. Is that what it is? They do, dude, they do an amazing job on it. And they use the internet theory that Johnny never did anything wrong. It was Daniel who was antagonizing him the whole entire time it shows it from johnny's perspective <laughs> and how he starts to do a cobra kai the right way i highly recommend it especially season one season two not as good but season one is one of the best seasons of television i have ever seen wow i'll have to check it out that is that is quite the accolades coming from timothy dooner <laughs> yeah wait oh, i love it should we, uh, should we do one more trevor milton clip and then we'll call up trucker bailey see he, right. he's a tick He's on TikTok. He's on YouTube. And uh, he has this incredible dash cam video that went viral of him avoiding a near accident. So we'll also get to see that. We'll play it in a minute. But first, a little bit more from Trevor Milton. But I can tell you right now that they are lies. 99% of them are all lies. There's a little bit of truth mixed in there when it comes to like disgruntled employees or whatever. No doubt. We got some people that, you know, we had to fire and they're bad people. They're just bad people. Well, just bad people, right? Just bad people. Fire the bad people. It's funny when people are trying to refute claims and they start talking in like percentages and they realize that like they can't say 100, so they'll say 99%, but then they realize that they <laughs> yep. like five allegations and if you refute three of them, then that's more than just 1%. Hey, uh, Trucker Bailey, sorry, we don't mean to talk over you here. We were just talking about this whole Trevor Milton story, but uh, thank you so much for joining us on the air, Mr. Beetle Bailey. How you doing today? I'm doing great. How y'all doing? We're doing awesome. We actually just talked to another uh, social media truck and TikToker, Wayne Craig. He was talking a little bit. He was initially going to come on to talk about the ban and what was going to happen next if they had banned TikTok. You actually are slightly, slightly, don't let Wayne hear this, but you're slightly more popular on TikTok than he is. You have more followers. And one of it was because of this incredible video. Maybe we'll play it first. Let's play this video, and then we will talk to you about what happened here, how you navigated this danger, and all that kind of stuff. Production, can you roll the tape of uh, of of Beetle Belly's uh, dash cam video? Yeah, we're taking a look at this right here. It should be coming up in just a second. Hopefully they play it in the back. Okay, there it is. Um, here it comes. So you are you're coming in fast, right? I mean, you're going at regular wow. highways. Well, how, how fast would you estimate you're going here? It is it's raining out, but all of a sudden, um, you you come across some some cars that you're like, there there's was there any chance would you would have been able to stop in time before hitting that white car? Uh, it just started raining, and most likely no, since there was still oil on the ground. Wow. And then you got really lucky here when you pulled off into into the the side room because there was no cars there, which I'm sure you saw when when you pulled into that. Is this sort of the, is this the closest call you've had behind the wheel? Is this the most harrowing maneuver you've done? Uh, for right now, yes. And I just figured that it had to be posted to show everybody what I went through. But you know, if something like this was to ever happen again, I would probably do something similar to that to avoid hitting anybody. I wouldn't just try to slam on the brakes and go right through the middle of them. Yeah, it was. Uh, it's a heck of a video, really. I mean, it just looks like a nice, smooth lane change right, ac- right across the grass and back into there. What was going through your mind? Uh, I was thinking I was going to hit the bridge pillar at first. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Good thing. I can imagine. Good thing. Hey, Bill, Bill, you're one of those guys. You're, you're almost a journalist of the road. You're constantly evolving your social platform with your YouTube. You got your dog Shasta. You got your branding going on. You've jumped on the TikTok platform. What are you What are you trying to sort of convey out there? I know a lot of your videos sort of show some of these close calls. Life is a trucker, some of the accidents and things like, like that that you've seen. But what are you trying to accomplish with uh, the social aspect of your truck driving? 
it's just a hobby for me. Uh, I like to drive trucks. I've been doing it since 1997 when I got my TVL. And I kind of took a little break for a little while and went into doing towing videos and doing towing. And then I came back out of that and started trucking again back in 2016 or 17. And I've been doing it ever since. Wow, so you've been back into it since 2016-17. Can you talk a little bit about your experience over this past year behind the wheel? Um, I've been working for the same company now for a couple of years. Uh, they pay me 60 cents a mile. They're out of Chicago area. Uh, the company name is TAK Trucking, TAC Trucking, and they only hire people with at least two years experience. So they hired me, uh, knowing that I had plenty of years experience. And sometimes we haul around concerts and Broadway shows and stuff like that when we're not hauling general freight. Uh, but since this virus came out. Uh, we're only hauling general freight right now. Yeah, you told me about that. You were on our show a few months ago. You talked at the beginning of COVID about how business has changed a little bit. And uh, are you looking forward to getting back into doing the, the live events polls? Is that is that more fun than just showing up at the docks with some uh, some vegetables or iPads? Yeah, it's it's probably like the best thing you can ever end up on because you are on a show, you only run at nighttime. Most people don't like to run at nighttime, so the traffic is very minimal. Uh, they put you on a salary of like $1,700 a week. Um, and then you get to see everything that goes on behind the scenes. They give you passes to go in and see shows when you need to see a show. Sometimes when you travel through a city, they might even give you tickets for your family to go watch a show. Um, it pays pretty good. Also, they have catering on those type of events where when you're hauling the show, they feed you breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Wow. That's awesome. I, I mean, so you're, you're through the whole North American tour with, with a specific show or a specific band. Does, uh, Shasta go, go with you on those? And, and what kind of dog is Shasta, by the way? Shasta is a full blood Australian shepherd. She's now about a year and a half old. Um, she uh, was bought from a breeder. Of course, some people frown upon that, but mm -hmm. I was looking for a specific color of a dog. Oh, sure. Hey, no shame. No shame, man. Don't let that lay over your head. If you're giving a loving home to a dog, it's all good in my book. Uh, I got to ask you, though, you know, one time on Road Dog Trucking, there was this talk about a carrier banning dogs. And that, I think, had the most. I actually did that show with Emily Zink, and I think we had more callers than we've ever had on that show. Dogs are a fundamental, huge aspect to a lot of drivers. How important is it to you to have the dog with you? And would you would you even consider driving if you couldn't bring Shasta in tow? I would not work for that company. I would go somewhere else. My company does not charge me to have my dog on the truck. I hear a lot about companies charging hundreds of dollars just to have the, the dog on the truck. Um, I've even seen with my company multiple dogs on the trucks. Um, yeah, so without my dog, I, I, I don't get out of the truck as much. I don't get exercise. I don't walk my dog. Um, also, it gives me someone to talk to. I say someone because she's almost like a human being. She listens to me and doesn't talk back. They're great therapists, aren't they? They just let you they just let you talk. And I remember when I got a real therapist, I had one for a little while. And I also had my dog and I and I would always get in trouble with therapists because I'd never talk. But like I already said everything to my to my dog. I don't need to I don't need to tell you that you you meatbag human being across from me, right? That's my opinion. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Hey man, how do people learn more? How do people follow catch catch some of your dash cam videos, see your TikToks and that kind of thing? Um, I also have a Facebook page. It's called Dash Cam, Dash Cam Video USA or something like that. Um, I got a little over 2,000 followers or people in that group on Facebook. Uh, if you want to follow that, you can just click on it. And if you've been on Facebook at least six months, you'll get pre-approved. Um, I also have YouTube, TikTok, Twitter, Instagram, all under Trucker Beetle Bailey. Excellent stuff, man. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for uh, your service out there on road. Stay, stay safe and uh, keep doing those, those great maneuvers, you know, just make sure you, uh, you end up on the right side of them. Right. Thank you, sir. Thanks, brother. Amen. Wow. Travel safe. You know, now that every driver has these dash cams, you know, I know a lot of drivers were complaining about them, but I think a lot, a lot do like them for insurance reasons, but then you also have this social aspect. It's like, Oh wait, I got my TikTok cam right on the, uh, the hood of my car.
Yeah, it's it, and I'm telling you that video was pretty amazing. Did it not look just a, like a smooth little lane change there? I mean, what a I mean, steady nerves and just took it right over. The camera didn't even really bounce much, but then like he's no. he, he in real time with the fog and everything, and he's like, okay, option one, I'm crashing this car. Option two, I make this move. I just don't want to hit that barrier. He, you got to make those decisions really, really quick. Fortunately, he was able to do them. I got to give a couple credits here. Credits for the audio. And in case anyone was one of the audio samples we've been using of Trevor Milton were from our What the Truck interview in June from Nicola World 2016, uh, courtesy of Omar from Whole Mars Blog. Thank you very much. He was our guest on today. He did the Johnny Rob interview that we had played. And uh, the one about the employees being fired, the bad people one, that was from Trevor's own Instagram. It was actually the second to last Instagram story he posted before he... Uh, before that, AK sort of banned him from doing anything on social media for the time being without their approval. And I don't know if uh, if you hear that whole entire rant by him. There's a lot of expletives, a lot of F the trolls, that kind of stuff. And uh, yeah, not allowed. Not allowed. No, not good. <laughs> well, we, we, man, we learned, we learned a lot today. You know, I got I to gotta give a little cowbell to myself and everybody, you, everybody on the Freightcast uh, side at Freight Waves over here, the people who helped promote it on marketing and all of that kind of stuff, because Freightcast, our Freight Waves suite of podcasts, it had the highest download day ever on Friday. So thank you very much. Then Saturday was a huge, the biggest Saturday ever, and Sunday was the biggest Sunday ever. So a lot of momentum. That's the one great thing about these virtual events, too. We get to convert some new Ears over to Freycast. If you haven't been converted to Freycast or the What the Truck feed, Freycast, look it up on your favorite podcast player. It has every single Freight Waves podcast, including the Midday Market Update, which will be tomorrow, including What the Truck. Put that coffee down the morning minute, which is a micro podcast, 60 second news headlines every morning. It's got exclusives, like I said, the Midday Market Update, Supply Chain Spotlight. There's a new fuller speed ahead, but I mentioned virtual events. You know what else you're going to find there, Michael Vincent? No, what are you going to find there? All the virtual events, all the virtual events. Oh, about- all the virtual events. It's too obvious yeah. for me. I couldn't. <laughs> I, isn't there one coming up on September 29th there, uh, Dooner? There is. So before you do that, if you go if you go on the Freightcast feed, you'll find a Waves Talk with IBM's Jonathan Wright. He explains at the American Shipper Global Trade Tech Summit how to prepare by building resilience and making your supply chain smarter. He's from IBM. It's probably pretty smart, right? I would think so. <laughs> I would definitely think so. You teased it. We got another virtual event. It's uh, what, September 29th virtual event. What is this one? The future of industrial uh, warehousing conference. We a uh, space we covered all summer. We had a summer of warehouse robotics, right? Yeah, we did. I, I'm still looking. I want one of those exoskeletons from Sarcos. Yeah, that was amazing. On Friday, if you didn't check out Friday's show, watch it back. You'll see those super exosuits. But this conference, September 29th, live, free, virtually, is all go to live.freightwaves.com to register. You join that Slack channel. You join us all day. We'll be emceeing that thing, talking about we'll get our warehousing hats on, right? Michael Vincent will ask the important questions that are going on there as uh, it's focused solely on the future of logistics, real estate, and the freight industry. Expect to hear about automation and all the uh, labor solutions that are going on there. You know, we keep throwing that trivia fact out there, but more people working in warehouses than ever in human history. Uh, you can reach out with us. Keep the conversation going at Timothy Dooner on the Twitter. That's D-O-O-N-E-R or look for me on LinkedIn. You can find him at Vincent Vincent the dude or Michael Vincent on Twitter. Michael Vincent, what uh, what do you make it today? What do you make of Nicola? What do you make of the whole thing? Wow, it's it's it, it, just crazy turn of events. I guess uh, you know Alan Adler's right. We should really you know he's not shocked by it. We shouldn't really be shocked by it. Uh, Gursky's coming in and and bringing a, a level of dare I say a higher maturity level to uh, their dealings and and really go silent when they need to be silent. Right is is kind of the thing that Alan uh, talked about and and that makes sense. Makes perfect sense. I think unknown caller. Oh, no. Do we want to listen to the spammer? No, we don't. Bye, spammer. You know what? I, what I, I think it's a good idea they got rid of. Uh, I mean, I, I, look, it's never good to hurt someone's livelihood. But I think for the company, for the people who are in the company not named Trevor Milton, probably a good move so that people when we're discussing Nicola, we can kind of distance. This is a demarcation line, you know, uh, Trevor Milton version of Nicola, Nicola moving forward. So we don't have to completely pour on a company with people who still work there. Right. People still work there trying to make a living, trying to make their livelihoods. Yeah, absolutely. They're, they're trying to build stuff. And I believe in the technology. I mean, it's a good way to go. And they, they need that chance. They need to calm this, calm this down, uh, get the social media aspect uh, in a positive light uh, when there are milestones hit instead of trying to make news. 
Yeah, catch Midday Market Update tomorrow. We're going to have Hunter Worley, Managing Partner at FBC Riverwood and Lorianne LaRocco, 12 p.m. Eastern Time, LinkedIn, Freightways LinkedIn, Freightways Facebook, then podcast players everywhere. Like we said, subscribe to that Freightcast feed. You'll get every single Freightways podcast. 